Hello everyone and greetings from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm Dr. Lesson Mancuso, the President and CEO of Japigo. I am honored to be part of this distinguished nursing lecture series and to speak to you about nursing from a global perspective. For those of you that aren't familiar with our organization, Japigo is a Johns Hopkins University affiliate that is saving lives, improving health and transforming futures for women and families for over 45 years. We do this by working with countries to help them identify their greatest health challenge, collaborate in developing innovative, sustainable solutions, and partner with them to get the job done. In 155 countries, we've translated clinical knowledge and program experiences into moments of care that mean the difference between life and death for women and their families. Access to life-saving healthcare for all people, whoever they are, wherever they live, is what our mission is and what drives us at Japigo every day. Much of this work is done by Japigo's global team of nurses working in 40 countries across a vast health portfolio as critical members in interprofessional teams. Now, during the worst health crisis in a century, they are also the cornerstone of our COVID-19 response, helping to mitigate the virus while working tirelessly to ensure essential health services continue to reach some of the world's most vulnerable communities. The vision of nursing through Japigo's work is a snapshot of the heavy lift nurses do in nearly every community across the globe. They are the largest healthcare cadre in the world. They provide 80% of our primary healthcare. These two reasons alone should compel us to consider whether we're investing in and utilizing the critical workforce as fully as possible. Because today, tomorrow, and in 20 years, our success as a global community begins with nurses. As we reimagine healthcare service delivery in the coming decade, we know that nurses are not being employed to their full potential. We knew this from the release last year of the first ever State of the World's Nursing Report, which Chupaiga was proud to play a significant role in developing. The report celebrates the incredible achievements of the global nursing workforce and also highlights the many needs most of these findings are echoed in my conversation with Japigo's nurses. I recently sat down with some of our nurses from Asia and Africa to hear their insights and the future of their profession, their challenges, what is and isn't working for nurses in their regions. Their responses coupled with the rich data from the State of the World's Nursing Report enable us to fine tune our nursing strategy to meet our collective global health needs and bring us closer to delivering high quality healthcare to all families, wherever they may live. Truly, if there ever was a moment for this conversation, it is now. As COVID-19 reveals the weaknesses in our health system, the reflections of these nurses leaders from their lived experiences are invaluable. We know of current rates, the world will be short an estimated 7.6 million trained nurses and midwives by 2030. As populations age and chronic and non-communicable diseases increase, this shortage only becomes more critical. There should be no lingering question that investing in nursing saves lives and livelihoods before a crisis hits. On a personal note, as someone who considers herself a nurse first, a nurse foremost, these in-depth conversations with Chapaigo's global nurse workforce were a pleasure. I know how critical their knowledge is to helping us close the equity gap that remains, to reach the unreachable, to bring high quality care to every doorstep. I also know how often their voices are not included in the conversation at the highest levels of global health, where key decisions are made. This remains a stubborn truth, despite nurses serving 
as our boots on the ground in the world's most challenging areas for health. They aren't on the front lines, they are the front lines. And as we look to 2030, their feedback must inform our strategy to train and position this critical health cadre within the larger global health workforce. Two key themes emerged from my conversations with Chipago nurses, working in countries as different as Myanmar and Zambia. They all spoke about the need for more investment and greater empowerment. When we talk about investment in nursing, what we're talking about is education. We're talking about retention, and we're talking about re-envisioning the role of what nurses can and should be doing. Because nurses know better than anyone, today, tomorrow, and in 20 years, our success as a global community begins with them. A strong nursing workforce begins with strong pre-service nursing education. Countries must frequently update their curricula to stay abreast of the global health trends. They must also invest in skilled and knowledgeable faculty, build the administrative capacity of nursing principals and promote competency-based skills lab and simulation capability. Most importantly, they must foster the important relationship between clinical and educational leaders needed to drive quality education. As a nurse from Pakistan told me, this kind of robust pre-service education gives nurses the skills and ethics to provide quality and evidence-based care to patients. Ultimately, she pointed out, it also improves patient outcomes. Thankfully, technology is expanding access to distance learning, which has proved effective in preparing nurses. As schools have to socially distance right now, their students due to COVID-19, they've become even more adept at teaching remotely. However, they still need our support. The most important aspects of nursing education takes place in the clinical facilities where students and faculty are at risk of exposure. Distance learning requires expertise and infrastructure that must be supported. It requires preparing teachers to do less lecturing and better coaching. It means purchasing and monitoring computers instead of classrooms. And it means increasing the capacity of clinical nurses to support students learning in clinical settings. All of this will ensure this transition to effective remote education and will continue beyond our current period of necessity. While nurses are innovating to use technologies to sustain access to education during the pandemic, they're also innovating daily in their workplace to improve access to care while remaining safe. Nursing leaders are harnessing technologies to improve monitoring, capacitating, and protecting the nursing workforce that has proved essential to combating the pandemic. The coming decade will see more nurses with higher degrees working in clinical areas. In Zambia, for example, the Ministry of Health has already created a position called clinical nurse. This position captures the many nurses who hold a Bachelor of Nursing degree and are in charge of a department such as neonatal intensive care and provide hands-on technical support and mentorship to other nurses in those units. This role was deliberately created to support nurses as they interact with patients, families, and other members of the healthcare team. A nurse in Ghana told me she sees the profession in 10 years as one with a lot of terminal degrees and advanced education in specialized areas with evidence-based practice to improve clinical, community, family practice, and training. I love the ambition and the confidence in that statement. In countries like Pakistan, we're seeing a lot of political commitment to strengthening the nursing workforce. The government is spending big money in scholarships for higher nursing education programs. Many nursing education institutions have already started PhD nursing programs through internationally recognized institutions. 
and nursing diploma programs are gradually shifting to degree programs to meet international standards. Diploma education in low and middle income countries remain, remains the norm. This is important for building career ladders that allow experienced nurses to earn degrees without needing to start over professionally. Their clinical experience needs to be respected. Of course, nursing education doesn't end when work begins. When you provide the majority of the world's hands-on healthcare, you must constantly keep your skills sharp. As we build the nursing workforce of the future, education must be an ongoing iterative process. We see this in our Japaiga workforce across the globe. When Mozambique confirmed the first case of COVID-19 this March, for example, Japaiga joined the Ministry of Health efforts to ensure nurses had the knowledge and skills to protect their patients and themselves as they delivered care. We led trainings to reinforce proper hand watching techniques, workplace safety, and the correct use of personal protective equipment specific to COVID-19. Once we have well-trained nurses on the job, retention and job satisfaction must be the focus in, in some ways. It, this begins before a nurse even chooses the profession. Just getting them in the door in some countries is the first battle to keeping them there. Nursing is not a first choice career in many countries, as a nurse from Asia shared with me. She cited the limited career pathway, the lack of respect given to nurses, and the poor salaries in the private sector as reasons. She was speaking for nurses in her region, but she could have easily been speaking for nurses in many places where professional ambition and higher education leaves many dissatisfied with their salaries and place in the medical hierarchy. Yes, governments must invest in massive acceleration of nursing education, faculty, infrastructure, students to meet the global need. But we must also ensure that there are good jobs waiting for nurses who have been educated Increasing the numbers of nurses is futile if they are not offered reliable employment and good working conditions. For a profession dominated by women, this means increasing progress on pay equity. It means auditing, hiring, and promotion practices and enforcing policies to prevent and address sexual harassment and violence in the workplace. 25% of nurses worldwide say they've experienced sexual harassment, yet too few countries have worker protections in place. Only 30% have measures in place to keep workers safe from physical and sexual attacks. Protecting the physical and mental health of nurses is key to their retention. Future policies must consider how we ensure enabling work environments for women. This includes flexible and manageable working hours that accommodate the changing needs of nurses as women and gender transformative leadership development opportunities for women in the nursing workforce. Many of our nurses connected retention rates to their ability to specialize and not be frequently moved around a facility or between facilities. Nursing workforce migration leads to a shortage of qualified and competent nurses, a nurse from Pakistan told me. Short staffing compromises quality of care and also results in increased staff stress and reduces staff well being. We must equal the playing field and pay in practice so that nurses stand head and shoulders with their contemporaries, regardless of gender, degree, or pay grade. Re-envisioning the role of nursing and stressing their impact, not just the hours they put in, is also key to attracting and keeping the best and brightest. Many of our nurses spoke of the desire for a greater scope of practice, more autonomy, and opportunities for interdisciplinary practice. Nurses have largely been seen around the world as the people in the hospital, but that's not going to be nursing in the future. 
technology innovations in COVID-19 are dramatically showing that we can and need to be able to do things differently. The pandemic has exposed that in many ways, the nursing profession has been working in outdated ways. It has forced us to pivot quickly and utilize the technology we already have. It accelerated the movement in healthcare away from hospitals and towards where people live. The emphasis is now on keeping people healthy before they need to be hospitalized. Underpinning the shift are nurses at the community level, helping people to manage their own health. From Fitbits to blood pressure cuffs, they're increasingly teaching families how to use technology at home and transmit the data directly to the clinic. This heads off serious illness before they begin while it lightening the burden on the facilities and on the health workers. Re-envisioning the role of nurses in the community, highlighting their flexibility, illuminating the breadth and depth of their specializations. All of this is elevating the image of nursing around the globe as leaders in their own right. It should be our expectation right now that nurses are involved in national COVID-19 task force and response teams in every country around the world. We saw a prime example of this in Lesotho after the pandemic struck. A team of Japigo nurses were retrained so they could safely be redeployed to sites where critical inpatient care was being provided for COVID-19 patients. In no time, they were caring for these patients to help relieve staff shortages. No handholding or physician supervision was needed. This is one of the thousands of examples on how COVID-19 has revealed nurses for who they've always been. Dynamic, innovative, resilient, flexible, tough under pressure. Nurses have been the drivers of our pandemic response from day one, innovating care to protect themselves and their patients. They have upended the pervasive assumption that nurses are the doers and not the thinkers. In fact, nurses have been key thought leaders at all levels of healthcare. Globally, the International Council of Nurses has called attention to the need of nurses in order to safely and effectively provide care. ICN has worked with the World Health Organization and others to highlight the intersections between the state of the world's nursing report recommendation and the impacts of the pandemic. Regionally and nationally, nursing leaders have worked to ensure their workforce is positioned where they're needed most, have equitable access to personal protective equipment, minimize stress, and optimize their mental health. Locally, in communities and facilities, nurses are working daily to find innovative solutions to protect their clients, their teams, and maximize access to care. From maximizing the use of telehealth during this time of social distancing to innovations related to HIV and cervical cancer care as countries go into lockdown. Truly, the global nursing workforce is driving innovations on numerous fronts. Artificial intelligence, research, future pandemic preparedness, chronic diseases, preventing and treating non-communicable diseases at the community level. Therefore, as we look to the future, nurses must be prepared to use technology in a variety of ways. They must be adept at working in interprofessional teams and they must play an even greater role in implementation science. Which brings us to our second theme, empowerment. When we talk about nurse empowerment, we're talking about three areas with great overlap, gender, hierarchy, and leadership. The global nursing workforce right now currently is 90% female. It is impossible to separate the issues of gender from the profession of nursing itself. And issues of gender disparity, which are pervasive in nursing, are inextricably linked to issues of hierarchy and leadership. To address any of these, we must address all of them. Because today, tomorrow, 
And in 20 years, our success as a global community begins with nurses. Japigo works to empower our global nursing staff, both at home and in the field. We remain one of the few nurse-led international health organizations in the world with a nurse at the helm and in key positions throughout the organization as chiefs of party, senior technical advisors, senior director of nursing, and the vice president of global programs. But as anyone who has worked across cultures can tell you, changing norms is not as simple as holding a training. Working to upgrade and expand the skills of nursing is not alone enough to ensure they become equal members of interprofessional medical teams. Nurses should never be considered the foot soldiers in the health system, while physicians are the field generals providing all strategic leadership. This requires empowering nurses with both the skills and the success and the respect of their peers across health professions and within the health system. Globally, women hold 90% of nursing jobs, but only 25% of the leadership positions in the field. As we look closer at the obstacles to nurse leadership and nurse empowerment, we often see two layers of identity complicating nurse empowerment, that of the nurse and that of the woman. Fundamentally, it's about power. It's why a nurse in Zambia bemoaned that not a single nursing home in her country is nurse run, and only two private nursing and midwifery colleges are owned by nurses. In Zambia, the nursing profession is one of the lowest paid in the country, leaving the country's 80% female financially disempowered. Couple this with a lack of exposure to business and entrepreneurial skills, and it's no mystery why there are few nursing business leaders. And if you think these issues are restricted to low and middle income countries, they're not. Here in the United States, for example, where nursing home residents are the most impacted by COVID-19, there are few nurses on any state or federal pandemic response team or advisory board. To be seen as equal members of the team, nurses must be encouraged to raise their voice and respectfully critique current practice norms. We need energetic, broadly educated nurse leaders who can identify and analyze problems, develop solutions, and act. Nurses who demand a seat at the table, and if it's not there, they bring up their own chair and use that chair in decision making and who deliver high quality patient-centered care for all those that need it. In Ethiopia, for example, Chipago is supporting the government to increase the number of skilled health workers, human resource managers, and practices. As part of this effort, we're establishing gender offices to support women studying the health sciences at universities. These offices provide financial services, life skills training, and tutorials, while also pushing against ingrained ideas that limit women's ability to work outside the home, particularly in traditionally male-dominated fields. These efforts are critical, both to empowering female health workers and to strengthening health systems. A lack of gender balance at every level of health leadership is detrimental to health systems because they lose the female talent, perspectives, and knowledge. The World Health Organization notes that having equal numbers of men and women at, level, at all levels in the organization does more than empower the workforce. It also improves quality of care and solutions shaped by a better understanding of the health systems. Issues of hierarchy are deeply entrenched and difficult to change, but change is possible. Take the area of safe surgery. There are currently 5 billion people worldwide who lack access to safe quality surgical care. As a result, 17 million people die each year, more than the number of people who die from HIV AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. These needless deaths happen not because we lack effective interventions to stop them, 
They happen because these interventions don't reach everyone that needs them. Nurses have proved key to stemming this tide. To dramatically expand access to this life-saving care, Topago is empowering all members of a healthcare team, including nurses, to deliver high quality surgical care. Access to safe surgery is severely limited by the limited numbers of professionals capable of providing the re required anesthesia. Nurse anesthetists, educated and regulated as highly skilled and specialized advanced practice nurses are answering the call in many Japaiko countries. Since we began our program in 2016, close to 60,000 major surgeries have been performed in four Japaiko supported countries. 32,000 of which were cesarean sections. In Tanzania alone, in less than two years, our program has reduced surgical deaths by 50% across 40 health facilities. This program is tangible proof of the incredible impact nurses can have when they're allowed to perform at their full capacity. As we continue to dismantle the limited view of what nurses can do, we have to look at the various obstacles by region. In some parts of Asia, and in Francophone Africa, for example, there are a high number of physicians, which then squeeze out opportunities for nurses. This feeds into both a lack of opportunity for nurses and a lack of opportunity to expand their roles. On the flip side, there are areas with greater nurse-led primary health care, such as outposts in India. In these cases, we must ensure that nurses are properly prepared to run these clinics with autonomy. But what we know is this, nurses can lead and do lead in many parts of the world. In Botswana, nurses are driving Japago's innovative work to eliminate cervical cancer. In Tanzania, they are key to our ability to reach more women with voluntary family planning services. In Ghana, Nurses are ensuring that COVID-weary patients still seek life-saving malaria services throughout the pandemic. We must build on these examples to expand opportunities for all nurses who seek a larger role and a voice in decision-making. In the words of a Chicago nurse from Ghana, the nurse should be the center of the healthcare team, equipped to take charge, to liaise between the client and the rest of the health team to ensure the best outcome. She should be able to call the shots and defend them. In the next 10 years, nurses should be positioned as leaders, not only within healthcare teams and the nursing profession itself, but beyond within the larger health system space, in governments, and in many positions where our expertise can lend itself to make these organizations stronger. Running ministries, running training institutions, nurses must be deeply involved in the space around research. And yes, as I said earlier, they must be in politics. As we look back over 2020's year of the nurse and the midwife, the essential contributions of nurses every day in every country were certainly recognized so too was the urgent need to build this health cadre in number, in quality, in scope of practice, and legal authority if we're to meet our global needs. None of our aims to eradicate poverty, to empower women and girls, to reduce stubborn inequalities across and within countries, none can be met without addressing the current global shortage of 18 million health workers primarily in low and middle income countries. I'll say it again, today, tomorrow, and in 20 years, our success as a global community begins with nurses. Together, nurses have the power and the influence to tackle big challenges, universal health coverage, non-communicable diseases, HIV AIDS, pandemics, cancer, and beyond. Acting both as individuals and members of the interprofessional teams, they are the backbone of the health systems around the world. As we develop strategies to best train and position them, 
within the future global health workforce, their viruses must be included in the conversation. And we must not wait for the next health crisis to respond to their needs. To make the necessary investments in their education, to truly understand who attracts them to nursing and what retains them, to be creative in re-envisioning what they can and should be doing, and to remove the obstacles to their empowerment. Florence Nightingale, the founder of Modern Nursing, famously said, nursing is a progressive art, such that to stand still is to go backwards. Let us never consider ourselves finished nurses. We must be learning all our lives. These words ring true today as they did then, as when they were spoken more than a century ago. The time is now for us to ensure that this competent, well-educated, ever-evolving workforce gets the recognition and the power in policy that it deserves. Before we conclude, I must thank the many staff whose thoughts are reflected in this presentation. My nurse colleagues in Africa, my nursing colleagues in Asia, and my nursing colleagues and my staff here in Baltimore. Thank you for listening to me here today.